Thank you for joining us. It's still our June 12 special as we celebrate with Nigerians within and without Democracy Day. I am Mariana Kuhn and still with me is... I still Kaya the lady in the oven changed my name. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we just have news coming in from uh, Lagos, apparently. Protesters have been arrested at the Ghani Fawemi Park here in Lagos. Uh, we will bring you details on that as we continue. But right now, we're moving straight to the economy. The performance of the Nigerian economy was mixed under former military head of state, Sani Abacha. Foreign reserves increased from less than $500 million to nearly $10 billion. The national debt and inflation also reduced, the Nigeria, and, but Nigeria remained a monoproduct economy, with oil as the major contributor to our economic growth. Procedures and processes were also abused, and there was unchecked looting. Quite interesting. And the short tenure of Abdul Salami Abubakar saw the depletion of Nigerians' foreign reserves and allegations of corruption. The economy grew under President Olusha Obasanjo with the liberalization of the telecommunications industry, the banking consolidation and the privatization program. The growth was sustained under President Goodluck Jonathan, but external debt ballooned and the foreign reserves tanked. Now, under President Muhammad Buhari, Nigeria has witnessed two recessions and we are currently on the way to a slow recovery. Well, and uh, we have joining us Abadaya Melafia, who is joining us from Plateau State via Zoom to take a look at how Nigeria has fared economically. He is a former deputy governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, a former official of the African Development Bank Group, and a former presidential candidate. Good afternoon, Dr. Melafia. Well, thank you very much for joining morning. us, Mr. Lafia. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Happy Thank Democracy you. Day. Um, let's start with looking at, you know, the economy. A lot of people have blamed the recessions that we've gone in and out of or the state of the economy on the successive governments um, to leadership. Some have also blamed it to bad um, judgments that we've made in terms of who sits at the top of the apex bank. But what do you think is the cause of the recession that we've faced? Is, um, we've had low oil prices. Um, could it also be poor management of the economy? Because we also have the Economic Council, uh, where the vice president under any administration heads. Well, you know, as you, you jolly well know, these things never happen on a straight and simple unilinear path from one cause to another. There are often a multiplicity of causes, uh, domestic, global, geopolitical, leadership, all of them combined together to create the scenario in which we find ourselves at present. And you will agree with me that it is far from being a happy scenario. We, in the space of five years, we've had two negative growths. I can tell you from 1968 to 1998, up to 2000 and, um, you know, uh, 15, we had had only one negative growth. And that was in 1968 at the peak of the civil war that growth came to minus uh, 2.7 or thereabouts. Uh, uh, but in 2016, we had a minus growth of minus 1.6. And in 2020, last year, we had a growth of almost 2%, 1.8%, minus 1.8%. So and to have these within you know, four or five years, is, is a very terrible time, situation. And for the five, last five years, we have never had growth that even reaches 3%. Com compared to Obasanjo's almost 7% growth throughout his period in office. I mean, that, that was extraordinary. Mm -hmm. uh, today, we, you know, the figures look very pessimistic. Uh, inflation, about 19%. Uh, unemployment, about 33 percent 
you know, Nigeria in 2017 overtook India as the world capital of poverty. So we are having very serious problems. Uh, there has been a massive fall uh, in foreign reserves from a peak of about $60 billion uh, to today around 30, 33, $34 billion. And not only that, uh, there's been a massive fall in the value of the Naira uh, from about 160 Naira to the dollar uh, in uh, 2014 to now almost 500, 480 uh, Naira to the dollar. It's an extraordinary fall of almost 200%. I mean, it's, it's, it's terrible. I mean, you can't imagine it. And of course, being a, an oil dependent rentier economy, we, we depend a lot on imports. And of course, a fall in the exchange rate, the devaluation of a currency uh, reflects in higher import prices and higher inflation. And inflation on its part undermines long-term growth, undermines investments, undermines employment. And so you have a vicious circle of poverty. What are the causes of that? Of course, uh, it's easy to blame uh, the global collapse in oil prices. That is a factor, but that is not the only factor because as a matter of fact, oil has increasingly played a lesser part than it did before in our macroeconomy. There was a time that oil accounted for 20% of the economy, in fact, 50% of the economy, then 20%. Today, oil accounts for less than 50% of our GDP. And uh, it accounts for only 50% of our, uh, you know, government revenue, even though it still accounts for over 90% of our foreign receipts, foreign earnings. So other sectors have come in and getting stronger, agriculture, uh, manufacturing, uh, you know, building and construction. These have become increasingly very important sectors. But even then, oil still continues to play a major part. The crisis of insecurity in our country, particularly in the rural areas, is depressing agricultural productivity and increasing hunger and food inflation. Food inflation for typical products like gari, beans, and so on, is almost 100% increase. So the poor are getting more desperate. The youth are more unemployed. They're getting very angry. I mean, we're talking about over 20 million Nigerians who are unemployed. And if you add to that number, the underemployed, and by the underemployed, I mean, uh, let's say graduate who read mechanical engineering is reduced to riding an Okada. Yeah, he's doing a job, but it's hardly the kind of job that he was trained for. So our situation is, is getting worse from bad to worse. Mm -hmm. And at the peak of it is leadership. There's a failure of leadership, no doubt about it. Yeah, be, yeah, we're going to talk about the failure of leadership, but I want to delve more into our dependence on oil because you've just mentioned that it's played a lesser role than it, than it used to in our, in our economy. But mm -hmm. let's talk about agriculture, something that we bandy uh, every time we talk about maybe the oil benchmark um, shifting from where it used to be or the, when the oil price falls, we remember that, oh, we have agriculture. And then we begin to say it sound more like we're going to do something about it. But yes, there has been a growth to our agriculture, but why have we not necessarily paid as much attention to our agricultural sector as we have paid uh, or, in fact, solely depended on oil? I mean, there are people who I, 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 might, I might not have grown up in that year or I might, might not have been born, but I remember uh, the fact that we used to, as a country, depend solely on agriculture and we did fairly well. Why have we totally jettisoned it? Being that even now, agriculture has gone beyond a hoe and, and a machete. We're now looking at um, mechanized farming and, of course, other things, technology-wise. Why has Nigeria not paid as much attention to it? In fact, we even have somebody sitting at the Africa Development Bank who used to be um, someone in charge of agriculture, and yet we seem not to be playing on the same levels like Rwanda or Kenya. 
Well, many factors account for this. You know, leaders, when they come into power, come with their priorities and they come with an agenda. I don't think this particular administration, the APC-led administration of President Muhammadu Buhari, has given enough attention to agriculture the way previous leaders did. Certainly, Olusha Gunobasanjo, a big-time farmer himself, paid very big attention to agriculture. And we never celebrate enough, I think, in my humble opinion, uh, the late President Umaru Musa Yeradwa. Uh, people don't know that after national service, he started his career as a farmer in Funtua. He was the general manager of his elder brother's farm, the late Musa General Musa Yeradwa. He worked on his farm for many years. So he had this passion for agriculture. And I remember at some stage I was an advisor to the Federal Minister of Agriculture. And uh, I recall that Umari Musa Yeradwa had committed huge amounts of money to build silos so that uh, there would be guaranteed prices for farmers for certain crops, you know, that will be bought and kept in those silos so that during times of shortage, they would be released in order to cushion off extreme volatility in agricultural prices and guaranteed income for rural farmers so that they have incentives to continue to produce and to grow more food. Unfortunately, I don't know what became of that project after the president passed away. And here we are with a president who is more interested in cattle. Uh, well, he's a cattle farmer himself. He's Fulani, or so they tell us. And so they have different priorities uh, and uh, agriculture is suffering. The insecurity in the rural areas is undermining agriculture. In fact, some people fear that this year we might face the ugly situation of famine and hunger, especially that the rains have been a bit temperamental. And in many, especially in the, in the savannah of the Middle Belt, a lot of farmers are very scared about going to their farms. Uh, they are being killed and maimed, their children maimed, their wives raped. There's a kind of unprecedented violence in the rural countryside. I grew up as a missionary boy myself in a village where my father was an evangelist. So I understand uh, the, the dilemmas facing farmers in the rural sector. And uh, we neglect that sector at our peril okay. because a great nation requires food security. Dr. Dr. Melafia, uh, I will come back to you, but quickly we want to tell our viewers to join us. You can watch this Democracy Day special live on our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa Lifestyle. You can also join the uh, conversation. Uh, that's, you can join the conversation by sending a WhatsApp and also make your phone call. The numbers are written on the screen. You can get more insight on this conversation. Please join us. If you need to leave your house and you don't want to miss anything, you can continue that um, with us on our conversation. Thank you so much. So, Dr. Melafia, talking about, let me use the buzzword that we've been using from different successive generations diversification, which is what she talked about. But as we speak, let's fast forward to our current reality. We're talking about the ICT, we're talking about the pharmaceutical, or call it health, that is trending now. Uh, like they describe data as the new black oil. And as we speak, we're talking about Twitter being banned. We're talking about uh, listening to the president this morning. He said the two drivers of insecurity, uh, quoting him now, of poverty and youth unemployment. So how do we stay with the trend? How do we maximize this ICT that we seem not to be doing nothing or little about it? Well, ICT can also be a driver we of, are. of poverty alleviation, if only we could do it the right way. Uh, some of us condemned the burning of or suspension of Twitter. I think it is misguided. I think it is wrong policy. Uh, and above all, it sends the wrong signals. It sends the signals that 
Nigeria is a very insular, narrow-minded, and inward-looking country that, that is not open to the rest of the world. And so the wrong signals that we have a government that is determined to repress the liberties of its citizens, particularly of young people who use Twitter a lot, who, in fact, even use it for business, you know, set up information systems for, for clients, and they are paid for their services, uh, where we are told that the loss, the suspension will cost us something like over a trillion naira a year. I mean, this is 10% of last year's budget of 10 trillion. So uh, I'm very worried about this. Uh, we, should, we ought to be a scientific country. Okay. We ought to be a forward-looking country. In the United States of America, Donald J. Trump said, tweeted in a manner that Twitter did not like. Twitter found it threatening and Twitter banned him. He is the most powerful country, you know, leader in the whole world, commander in chief of the most powerful country on earth. Donald J. Trump was not foolhardy enough as to ban Twitter. And I don't see why anyone in this country should ban Twitter because he was not happy with being suspended at the expense of 200 million of his own citizens. It is not only misguided, it is wrong, and it is despotic in nature and character. Dr. So, Melafia, just before we wrap this uh, segment up, I, I'm very curious, I want to ask, because I'm, I know that you're a very big critic of um, governments, including this government, but I want to ask, if you were seated on the same table, I remember under the Good Luck um, um, and under the Basanjo administration, if I'm very uh, correct, we had a coordinating minister for the economy, which helped, you know, to probably set the economy on the right, um, you know, uh, direction, even though um, at, at that point we had our own problems. Um, but right now we're not necessarily sure uh, where our economy is headed. But if you were opportunity to sit on a table with the um, Economic Committee or uh, the, uh, the Minister of Finance, what ideas would you be giving? What should we be dropping off these strategies? If, if there's even a blueprint for our economy under this administration, what would you be advising them to focus on? They have two more years. And, and of course, Nigerians are already tight. They've over-tightened their belts because of how bad the situation of things are because people's take home pays um, people's take home pay no longer takes them home what would be the idea that you would give in the interim that could help nigeria steer our economy in the right direction i do not know whether my response will be useful in this regard i don't think it will be because you are dealing with people that are totally incorrigible they are unteachable, and they are not interested in anybody who is not of their camp. I am not a Muslim, and I'm not a Fulani, so I don't think they want to even hear the views of people like us. I don't want to waste my time. I don't want to waste your time. And, but let me make this very important point. You describe me as somebody who is a critic of the government. I don't consider myself like that at all, and I have never packaged myself like that. You know, there are Nigerian politicians that if they are not in power or they don't have a position, uh, it is their stock in trade to be attacking everything being done, uh, to be criticizing. And when they are given a position, they shut up immediately. Look, I am not that kind of person. Through my education, uh, my, my faith, my intellectual convictions, uh, I see myself as a public intellectual yeah. and a public intellectual who is also a statesman. A statesman is not somebody who, for him, politics is do or die, okay. uh, who is ready to suspend okay. his, 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 his convictions for temporary gain. I am not that kind of person. Okay, and Dr. I have Milafia. a conscience. My conscience troubles me. Uh, Dr. Milafia, so Dr. Milafia I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I, no, 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 no. no. I when you kill so many, when you rape women, you kill children in the very eyes of a government that has refused to do anything about it. Okay, Dr. Melafia, 
Keep I'm so sorry. Our, our time is fast, man. I think you've succeeded in uh, letting us know that uh, you we shouldn't describe you as a critic of government. And uh, yeah. I wish time would allow us to listen to you on the way forward. We never can tell what your advice might be to maybe not this government, maybe succeeding government, just for the test of time. But I'm so sorry, uh, we have to wrap up this particular segment. Look, I Thank have you. I have fantastic ideas. I have great ideas, and I have a master plan. I, I think we will do that on our conversation. If, if we could implement them. This country, my vision. Let me tell you, my vision is to benchmark Nigeria against Germany. Not That's even Britain. Britain is too small, too thank poor. Thank you so much. I think we will, we will, South Africa we will is take too small, too poor. I want to benchmark Nigeria with Germany. That is the standard I've set for myself. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Milafia. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry. we're out of time, um, Dr. Milafia. We have exactly. to go. Well, as... Yeah. Uh, Thank you very much. Well, as we continue our Democracy Day special, Plus TV Africa's Jacinta Obioku went to talk to a set of people born after 1979, millennials and Generation Zs. This is her report. Thank you.